You may have heard this already, and for those of you that follow me on social media, you've probably seen a few posts that I made. I don't assume everybody or, or anybody follows me on social media. In fact, if you don't want to, you can unfollow me. It's fine. There's an unfollow movement happening with Pastor Ben right now. Go for it, you know. Um, but I'm just identifying the fact that if you do, uh, you've seen some posts that I've made about something special that, was, that, was ha- that started last week on February 8th, Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky, which is effectively Nowheresville. There was a chapel at this university with uh, maybe around 100 students that were in attendance. It was a normal day. It was a normal service. They had worship. They had a message on the love of Jesus for us and through us. I actually watched the message maybe 25, 30 minutes long. It wasn't eloquent. It wasn't polished. It wasn't dynamic. It was just a, a normal message for a chapel service. After the message, they had some worship. Several students stayed to continue in worship. They stayed for an hour. They stayed for two hours. And when university students don't show up to class, a couple people wonder what's going on. So folks made their way over to the chapel to see what was happening. And when they got there, I've heard it described that there was just this sovereign presence of God that you could just sense. Um, A lot of the people that are on this university, you know, they're not Pentecostals. I mean, they don't talk like that. So for them, they're almost like kind of mainline. And for them to say there was this sovereign presence of God, it's not normal language. And you could tell that when you, when you listen to some of the testimonies. The students kept worshiping for several hours. It became an all-night thing. Some of them slept in the chapel. And uh, by the next night, this is what it looked like. I want you to turn to the next, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. It's been like this ever since. Two times a day, they have four to six hour services. And then outside, it looks like this. I want you to see what it looks like outside. I've had maybe a dozen friends go, um, uh, 10 10 to 12 people that I know have been there, called me in line. I've seen what's going on. You have to go a couple hours early if you're going to make it into the chapel. Now you can barely get into the chapel. They've opened five overflow rooms. This is a university. This is not a church. They're not, this is not typical for them. They don't know what to do. Um, You can hear in the dean and some of the other leaders on campus, they have no idea how to facilitate something like this. People are coming out online and criticizing it because some are calling it a revival and others are calling it an outpouring or, or they're saying this can't be revival. Here's what we know. Young people, old people, and everyone in between, people are flying from all over the country. They're waiting in line for hours to sing to Jesus. I don't know what you call that. I call it a move of the Holy Spirit. And for all of the critics, I just am ashamed that people would talk like this. Do we need to discern things? Of course we do. There's not a lot of teaching happening though. They're confessing their sin, they're repenting, and they're singing to Jesus. Not many teachers, no famous preachers, no famous worship leaders, and they're not letting anybody live stream. So whenever you see the live streams on YouTube, it's because somebody's disobeying the orders that they're giving. They're not trying to make it a show. They're not trying to make something happen. And I appreciate that because I think if there's one thing that many of us are tired of, it's that manufactured revival culture that we know leaves people exasperated and exhausted. What we want is the real thing. And so I appreciate how they're seeking to steward this. In fact, um, Pastor Ryan was telling me that they're going to shut down the public meetings. And so I read this morning, they've decided that this isn't supposed to be something that is just for them and from them. They believe that the fires are supposed to go out all over the country. So they're shutting down public meetings um, this week because they believe that this is supposed to happen everywhere and anywhere where there's hungry people who are just seeking God with the only agenda of knowing him and making him known. I respect that. I appreciate that. I do. And, and I think that it is marvelous to hear that not only is it happening there, but I've just heard reports from all over the country where things are happening just like this. Some folks are like, well, it's got to, this has got to happen if it's a revival and this has got to happen. You know, when a revival, a real revival happens, what you'll notice is 
we come alive again. We come alive. We come back alive to the truth of the gospel. And the byproduct of that is the mission of Jesus goes forward. Here's what we know about the United States of America. We are absolutely in a decline in Christianity right now. From the last statistics I read in 2010 until I think it was 2021, there's a 15% decline in professing Christians. It's probably worse right now. So you could say there's a 20% decline of Christianity in America right now. And this is part of the reason why is because when anything happens, we start to criticize it and come out and talk about what it is or what it isn't. And I think we need to welcome all that God does because we need a reviving work of the Holy Spirit in the United States of America. We need a work of the Spirit to happen. And so this is a precious and a sovereign moment of God, not just in Wilmore farmland, Kentucky, but right here in Federal Way, Washington. I say amen. Now, I believe this is a fresh outpouring. And you know what? I started reading in the Bible all of these places where God poured out his spirit. And the only thing that you could say, or the only way you could explain it is that God did something that men and women could not do. So I just took some time this week and I wanted to talk to you about a fresh outpouring. And I was thinking first in Luke chapter three about the outpouring at the Jordan River. And let me summarize it because it's the entire chapter. Here's what happens. John the Baptist is Jesus's cousin and he was the forerunner of the Messiah. He began preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. All Judea and many from Jerusalem came out to the Jordan River to hear and to see what was happening. And they streamed down the bank into the Jordan River to be baptized by this guy that definitely did not dress for success. It describes him as a wild, crazy looking prophet who, wear, who wore camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. All right, John preached repentance. He told people to turn from their sins and to confess. And in Mark chapter one, we studied this a long time ago. It says that they publicly confess their sins. There's thousands of people. They're publicly confessing their sins while they're in the water. And John calls the Pharisees that came out, the religious leaders, the one that taught the Torah, he called them a brood of vipers. You remember that? He says to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you about the judgment that was to come? I just think that's a bad day when you're called a snake. <laughs> Your whole life you trained to be um, a religious teacher of the law. And now you've got this crazy man standing in the Jordan River preaching and thousands of people come out to see him and he calls you a snake. Oh, this is just, I mean, I'm trying to paint the picture. If, you could, if we could try to see this, like this isn't a fiction story. This really happened. So John's there and he's baptizing people and they thought he was the Messiah. But he says this to them in Luke chapter three. I'm not him. There's one coming after me that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So they listen to this crazy guy preach repentance. He's confrontational. Repent from your sins. And he's no respecter of persons. He just says exactly what's in his heart and it's from God. And this is what the people say in Luke chapter 3 and verse 10. And the crowds were questioning him after his preaching saying, what shall we do? You know, that's not the common response, is it? People hearing a guy like this, they're not asking any questions about this. They're getting up and walking away back to Judea, back to where they came from. But they heard him and they came under divine conviction and said, what do we need to do? And he answered them and he said, the man who has two tunics is to share with the one who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. Share what you have. The Tax collectors also came to be baptized and they said, teacher, what shall we do? And he said, don't collect more than what you have been ordered to collect. Soldiers were questioning him and said, what about us? What do we do? Can you, do you get the picture? People are saying, what do we need to do in response to this moment? And he says to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse them falsely. Be content with your wages. In other words, stop 
extorting people. Stop stealing. Stop robbing. And if you've got too much, share with people that don't. Become sensitive to the needs around you. This is what God wants. He wants a repentance that, not, that is not about being sorry for what we've done. It's about changing and becoming more what he wants. He wants repentance. It's not just being sorry, it's changing. He's saying, you got two coats, give one away. You've got more food than you need. Think about the people that don't have food. This was the response and they did it and they did it. Well, that's not the only outpouring. There's another one in Acts chapter two, us Pentecostals are familiar with. After the resurrection of Jesus, he told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem. When the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you can go and be my witnesses. So on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out with incredible supernatural signs. The Bible says they spoke with other tongues, which means they spoke in 13 dialects, languages that they did not know and had not learned. They begin to praise God in all of these other languages and everyone heard what was being said. It was an incredible and marvelous event. Many people were in shock. They were in awe. Some people mocked and said those that were having this experience were drunk, but the disciples were emboldened so much so that Peter gets up Peter, the one that had just been a coward, the one that just denied that he had known Jesus, he gets up full of the Holy Spirit and he preaches in front of thousands of people. And his sermon is so provocative that I encourage you to read it. I hadn't read it for a while, but I freshly read Acts chapter two. And he basically told people, you murdered the son of God. I'm reading it and I'm going, that's exactly what he said. He's like, and you crucified the Lord of glory. Can you imagine me saying that to you today? Of course you can. <laughs> Pastor Ben would say that to me today. <laughs> he said, you did. And so their response, they were so gripped. They were so much under conviction that they said, what should we do? Do you see the theme here? Luke chapter three, and now we're in Acts two. What do we need to do? They're not running away. They're not walking away. They're saying, what do we need to do with this provocative message? Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent. Same thing, repent. Each of you be baptized, water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. It's an outpouring. A sovereign moment. 3,000 people give their life to Jesus and then they baptize them spontaneously like right there. That's a mess. I know it's a mess. I don't know how we would do something like that. It would take us a week to baptize 3,000 people, but that's what they did right there. There's another outpouring here and I'm just calling it the believer's home because the person doesn't have a name. In Acts chapter four and verse 23, Peter and John were arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus. They were proclaiming that he saves, that he delivers, that he forgives, that he is the Messiah. And for this, they were put in prison. Then they were beaten and they were told not to speak in the name of Jesus. And in Acts chapter four, they said back to those that told them not to speak, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, we are not going to do what you're telling us to do. We are going to speak about Jesus. And so they, of course, beat them a little bit more and warned them about speaking in the name of Jesus, but they had to release them from prison. Immediately, Peter and John went to a friend's house in Jerusalem, and the Bible says they told them everything that happened. Immediately, they began to pray. That was their response. They quoted Psalm chapter 2, they quoted the scriptures to the Lord and they begin to pray that scripture. And then here's the rest of their prayer in Acts 4.29 as they cried out together as one people. Now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with confidence while you extend your hand to heal, performing signs and wonders that they would take place to the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. The church became bold with the witness of Christ. This is a fresh outpouring and it was, it was needed. I just made, so I, could, I mean, I could talk to you about more outpourings. What about the one at Antioch? What about the one at Philippi? What about Ephesus? We could talk about church history. I just showed you something that's happening fresh in our times to be encouraged by and excited about. But I wanted to note just a few things that I learned by reading these stories this week. 
observations about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Number one, God moves in places that we would not always expect, kind of like Wilmore, Kentucky. Number two, God moves in ways that we would not always expect. He does things that we might immediately think that can't be God. He does. Number three, God moves through people that we would not always expect, nor would we choose. It's amazing how God will raise up young people that don't know the theology that you know, but they're hungrier maybe than you are. God chooses people that say yes. He has to bypass people that will say no. It takes a radical humility to be used. It doesn't take uh, an incredible expertise. That's what we think. We think, who's qualified? Who's got the right degree for this thing? Who's got the right credentials? You know, God bypasses people like that all day long for the one that's hungry and simply says yes. Did you know that? We're always trying to qualify everybody by, by the way men and women qualify people. And the Lord seemingly, I mean, I don't know, read this book. As far as I can tell, he tends to call people that like I probably wouldn't choose. So that says something to me. Number four, people repent for their sins and surrender wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ. H have you recognized that today it seems like the message is a little bit different from what the message was back then? That it seems like we are looking for the bless me version of the gospel, man-centered version of the gospel, rather than the God-glorifying version of the gospel, where we repent, where we turn, where we give our lives to him, where he is everything, where it's about the glory of God. Don't you feel like something has changed when you read the gospel and you just read it plainly and you look at these words and you think, how do I respond to this? I don't know what other people are preaching. I'm not sure what everyone else has said through church history, but how do I respond to that? How do I bend my knee to this message? People repented for their sins. They did it publicly. They did it unashamedly at times. Number five, believers receive fresh love for Jesus and courage and boldness for the mission. Don't you want a fresh zeal for Jesus? Like a love that overtakes you? You've had it before? Isn't it amazing how the pleasures and the cares and the worries of this life will steal that from you? And then we have a way of, of, in a sophisticated way, we justify it. Like, no, 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 I love God. And I, and I know we do, and I'll speak for myself. I know we love God, but something is missing and we know it, but we spend our time justifying it instead of moving towards God. Instead of asking more of God, instead of seeking more of God, instead of making those adjustments, like we need, the reason that stuff like this in Wilmore, Kentucky is happening is because we need a fresh zeal for Jesus. And out of that will come all of the doings. But we've got to remember who we are if we're going to start doing what Jesus says. We've got to remember that it's loving God first and loving people second. We just go out and try to do and grind it out without this love filling our heart. I love the fact that God will fill us with fresh zeal for him. Number six, the gospel message spreads through the emboldened witness of the church. Number seven, many oppose the work of God indirectly or directly. I, I mean, you read these stories, the Pharisees and the religious leaders come out, the soldiers, many, some respond to Jesus or John the Baptist, some don't. You read in the upper room when they make their way outside and clearly there is something fresh happening. It says that there are people who are mocking saying, these guys are drunk. They're trying to cut down what God is doing because they don't understand it or they're resisting it anyways. But there are always people that oppose it. Number eight, signs, wonders, and miracles, healings, deliverances, and of course, the most important salvations take place. Supernatural power happens. And lastly, something that you can't avoid in the book of Acts is the church presses into corporate prayer because this feeling of what do I need to do just won't go away. It just won't go away. And so what we can do is we pray. We pray for more. We ask God to continue to pour out his spirit and sustain what he is doing. I was thinking um, this week, not only about the outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the Bible and some of the things we've seen recently, but I was thinking about our church. I was thinking about what we've seen recently. And I wanna attribute that to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm not calling it a revival. 
I'm not saying we're living in full-blown revival, but what do you think this is when I read this to you? What, what is 40 people, 41 from last night, 41 people coming to Christ or rededicating their lives to Jesus in the last two months? What is that? What is 15 plus three more last night? We had three spontaneous baptisms last night because I woke up yesterday morning and I, and I felt like the Lord wanted, wanted us to fill up the baptismal tank. So I called Scott and Tony. I said, can you fill up the tank? They said, yes. I said, can you make it warm? <laughs> you know, I don't want people to <laughs> do the best we can. Amen. It's not the Jordan River. So, and three people last night got baptized right there. 18 people water baptized in the last couple months. Many healings and deliverances. I shared one with you through receiving prayer. Six children dedicated to the person of Jesus. You don't have to dedicate your kids to God. But isn't it special when we do? It's a holy moment where we say, this child belongs to Jesus. That's a holy moment. That, to me, requires a conviction of the Holy Spirit. I mean, certainly you could do that religiously, but to me, I think when we hold our children before God, that's something, that's something that the, the Spirit of God does. And I don't know why this is, but we've had 200 more people from December to January join us in physical attendance. We had a jump, like we had just the second week of January, we had more people than, than we had seen for, since the pandemic started. And so many new people have joined us in the last uh, little while, so many people. And uh, I don't know why, I don't know what to say about that. I don't think my preaching's that good, so <laughs> amen. <laughs> don't say amen, come on, don't. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> just let me say it, all right, let me put it down. What if God's doing something special and it isn't about who leads worship or who preaches? We have a 45-year history in this congregation of so, so much that the Spirit of God has done. But I, I believe that God's moving all over this country and all over this world. There are a lot of people that are just super negative about things right now. It's like everything's bad to them. I would encourage you to cancel your plans to be miserable. And for those of you that are waiting for the rapture, I would tell you to unpack. <laughs> I think we got some work to do. I think we got some things to say. I think we got some people to help. I think we got some stuff to pray. I think now's the time. And if you're not convinced that we need a revival, please listen to these words. We do. We need a work of the Holy Spirit. We need a sustained outpouring of the Spirit. I don't just want to have a great weekend. This stuff that I read to you, this is the Lord working in our midst. This is the Lord working in our midst. And we need a sustained work of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you just for a moment about our uh, Niger team that is in Africa right now. They've been there for about seven days. So far, they've medically treated 400 people and 100 of them have prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Can I get some excitement in the room right there? Come on. A hundred people, 99.3% Muslim country, hundred people. And then this Sunday uh, will be the first Sunday they've ever been to church. Many of them are going to church for the first time that have been led to Christ an elderly man who was seen last year in the clinic came because he could barely walk from the pain he had in his lower back and knees. He had multiple medications ordered in his clinic card, but first went to the prayer station. What a miracle. He was healed by Jesus. Now he can walk with no pain, no prescriptions. He returned today for a follow-up appointment, and he was so happy. He was not only able to walk without pain, he is now walking in the kingdom. A lady with glaucoma in one eye and a cataract in the other had to be led through the clinic by her girls. Jesus healed her. She is now walking unaided with eyes that are open and that can fully see. A dozen people demonically possessed falling out in the clinic, manifesting. They have been completely revived by the delivering power of Jesus. People saturated with Islam have been radically saved after hearing the gospel for the first time. The love that they met through the different stations of the clinic opened their hearts to Jesus' love. Over 25% of everyone who we have seen have been set free and have been saved by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. Can you get me the microphone? We need a revival. 
We need an outpouring. And we need to pray for this in our, in our midst. And uh, I wanted to have a few people from our church share a little bit about what God has done in their life. Chris, um, where are you? Chris Larson, where, where are you? Yes, sir. Come on forward. You sat all the way in the back. Now we got to watch you come all the way up. Come on, sir. This is Chris. I want him to share just for a moment about what God's doing in his life. And I want you to listen with an open heart and open ears. Come on, Chris. Well, about um, nine months ago, I came to this church. And it was really, <clears throat> at that time, I was really deep into alcohol and been most of my life. And I felt something come over me. And uh, sorry, this is hard. <clears throat> And I gave my heart to Jesus, and immediately I was just delivered. Yes. I didn't crave anything. I didn't want it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And since that time, I've just been growing. Um, I have a heart uh, hunger for God's Word and for helping people. I used to have a really critical attitude, but now i just full of compassion for people and I can't. I used to be full of anger, and now I'm like crying all the time. So I don't know what's wrong with me, but uh, everything's yeah. right with you, man. Yeah. That's what's happening. So I'm continuing to grow, and I, I love the people that I've met in this church, and uh, I'm just going to keep going forward. And I, I love Jesus with all my heart. Come on, hey, stay right here. Come on, send your hands out right here. We just want to love on you, man. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for Chris. We bless him. We thank you that he's a son of the house and that he's your son. God, we ask you to raise him up as a bold and a mighty witness in the days ahead. God, we receive his testimony and it emboldens us, it strengthens us. And I pray that in his heart, Lord, he would know that's what this was today. It was to share with the people of God. We need to hear what you've done in him because those are the things you've done in us. That's what you need to do for someone here today. We thank you, Lord, that you are shattering the bondage of alcoholism in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, come among us in your healing and your delivering power. This is what you do because it is who you are. So God, we pray that you would take Chris and that you would make him a bright and burning lamp for so many people to hear about your delivering and your saving and your healing power. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, man. Come on. Would you show him some love today? Kiana. This is Kiana, and she's been here a long time. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Kiana. I have been attending this church since I was less than a year old. Um, and I used to have like a really good relationship with God. And the past couple years, I was really angry with him and I was really struggling. I struggled really bad with depression and um, I blamed all of that on God. I, I was so angry with him for the things that were going on in my life and, and I was unhappy and um, I ended up going to Germany to YWAM. Um, I, was, I was called on the trip but I didn't know that it was God that was calling me. I, I thought that it was, I was gonna travel and I was gonna see the world and, and he wrapped up this trip in a pretty box and put a bow on it and little did I know he had other plans for me. So when I went, um, he completely changed my life. He, um, met me where I was at and, and he showed me that I am his daughter and that he loves me. And um, there, was, there was a night when I heard him speak for the first time in years and that day I had just been feeling really annoying. And the first thing he says to me in years is, Kiana, I love it when you're annoying. Um, and it just, it, it made me laugh sharing that because I was like, you know, he's so personal and he knows you so well. Um, he knows you better than you know yourself. And, and I, I forgot that. I convinced myself that I knew myself better and I don't. And um, since I've come back, he has just, he saved me from my church help or from my, from my church hurt. I, I'm able to come to church and feel so good. And um, I've been consistent. I've been inviting friends and he's just consistently changing my life. And I, I wouldn't change that for the world. So Amen. Yeah. Stay right here. You forgot, hold on, you I forgot, forgot something, something really, really big, important. you guys. Yeah. Um, yesterday, after I shared my testimony, um, Ben called out. I was planning to get baptized in April, um, and God was like, nope, 
<laughs> you're not waiting, it's gonna happen today. So I ended up getting baptized yesterday for the first time in my life as well. So yeah. And I also want to say, stay stay up here. I also want to say that um, she's got like half a row of people coming with her, <laughs> and some of them have come to Christ. And one of them we baptized last night, her mom was on the front row. I don't I don't know what that does to you, but like there is a fire in this young woman right now and it's causing it to spread into other people. And I've gotten to witness it and we're proud of you. We're proud of how you're obeying Jesus. He's proud of you. And I, I want you to extend your hands to her because she has a fire and I wanna see this evangelism gift explode in her life. Come on. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your anointing upon Kiana. We ask you, Lord, that you would baptize her in the power of the Holy Spirit fresh today. We ask that you would send her out, Lord, a bright and burning lamp. She is a bold witness. She is a bright light. We pray that her friends and family members would see what you're doing in her and you would repeat that in them. And Lord, it would feel like effortless, God. It would just seem like you are drawing people like a magnet and that she would just share about what you're doing. And I pray this would be a season of fruitfulness in her life where she would see how great you are. And while you've been waiting on her to say yes to you, now there's going to be a breaking forth. This is what you were waiting for, Lord. You were waiting for her to say yes because there's a breaking forth that's coming and it's going to touch so many other people. I pray you would encourage her today and strengthen her in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hold on. This is Cademan, and I uh, want him to share what God's doing. Okay. Well, um, I'm a Running Start student, and I'm in 12th grade, and uh, I go to Highline College. And so this last week, um, I had this amazing opportunity to share with the student the gospel. And so after my class, I went to the school cafe to grab a coffee, and I was on the side waiting for my coffee after I bought it, and I saw this group of girls. And the best way I could describe it is God just, like, highlighted one of them to me, and so I was waiting for a word from God, and I was listening. I was like, God, what do you have for her? Is this something, something you want to speak to her? And so then um, I was kind of just looking at her. I was kind of out of it. Um, and, and then um, the group of girls left, but then she came back and walked over to me. She said, hey, do, do I know you? Because I was looking at her. I kind of had to snap out of it. <laughs> but um, And then I said, no, no, I don't know you. You don't know me. And then... But since I got to have a conversation with another student, I just had to share with her the love Jesus has for her and everyone else. And so then, um, and then, so we got into a conversation and I got to share with her my faith. And then she shared with me her faith in Hindu, Hinduism. And, but I got to share with her that I haven't been a Christian that long and what Jesus had done in my life and what he brought me from. And, um, and, now, as I was sharing the gospel and listening to her talk, too, um, I got a verse for her, and I took out my Bible from my backpack, and I said, I haven't, uh, I'm in a relationship with Jesus. I'm just learning to hear his voice, and I believe he has a word for you right now. And so I showed her the, so I gave her my Bible and said, this is a verse. And then she just started to tear. And then um, she continued to tell me that she recently ran away from, tried to run away from home, and that she's been feeling hopeless in this broken family. And I said, you know, with the relationship with Jesus, it's, it's exciting to walk out a relationship every single day and know that he's by your side and he loves you. And, and I said, it's for everyone who wants it, including you. And so she asked how to do it. And so I had the privilege to pray the prayer with her where she gave her life to Christ that right there in the cafe. <laughs> And so, so this, this next week, I'm, uh, I'm bringing her a Bible, and she's getting involved in the Christian, in the Christian club at our school, too. Come on. I want to well, pray for you, man. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for Cademan. We bless him in the name of Jesus. God, we ask you right now that you would fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we ask you, that you would use him to spread the gospel across his school and with his family and his friends. Lord, we pray this wouldn't stop, that this is just the beginning. We thank you, Lord. Fill him, baptize him fresh, Lord. Give him a reverence for your word, Lord, like he's never known before. We pray that he would love your word. He would love to pray. He would love to share. 
There's a new strength and a new boldness. I pray would fill him and you would send him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, man. God bless you. Come on. Will you stand this morning? Will you stand? I'm going to ask you to today. Um, don't leave yet. Don't leave. As you'll notice, I saved some time. I saved some time. I mean, you're free to do what you want, but um, I want to ask you a question. If you're here today and you've never been water baptized and you believe in Jesus, we're going to be up here and we want you to come forward. And here's what I would say to you. Don't wait. If you believe in Jesus and you've not been water baptized, I'm not trying to pressure you. It's not hype. It's not emotionalism. I'm just saying when you start reading this book, something you realize is that hesitation doesn't lead to good places. Obedience. It's simple. It's like this. Yes. That's it. And we complicate it with all of our theology. It's a yes and, or it's a but. But obedience is really simple and it's beautiful. God loves it when all we do is say yes. That's, he doesn't need a lot, guys. And I know that there are some here today and there will be here the rest of our services that need a touch of the Lord in their life. You need, you need fresh zeal for Jesus. You need that. And so we're going to worship for a little while. And uh, I feel like the Lord just said, open the altar. And man, it's kind of nerve wracking to come forward, isn't it? It's kind of weird in our church because like we know each other, like we're going to go see each other in the Connect After Service. But here's what I, I would like to give you an official theological statement. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Every period of my life where I've been hungry, something has overtaken me where I stop thinking about anybody else except for him. And so if you need to be water baptized today, we've got, a, we've got warm water. You're like, Ben, I don't got shorts or shirts. We went to Fred Meyer's. We've got shorts. We've got shirts. We've got clean towels. These are brand new guys. Nobody wore this stuff before. We got you. We knew, even germaphobes, we, we want you to get in that tank and be baptized in Jesus' name so that the spiritual germs would go. And so if that's you, me and Pastor Scott, we're going to be right here and we're going to wait for you to come forward. Come and tell us during this worship time and then we're going to get everything ready. We'll bring you back there and then we'll baptize you. But for the rest of us, we're going to go back into worship. I'm going to pray and then this, the altars are open. We have communion available. We want you to come forward if you feel led to come forward. If you want to just come forward and worship, do that. If you need prayer, we're going to have prayer partners available. If you have children, you got to get them in six minutes, but you can bring them back in. All right? Because they're going to be down there not having revival. So let's pray. Let's pray. And then do as the Lord leads you in this place. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray with me. Lift your voice to God. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. And we ask you, Lord, that you would do what you want to do. Whatever you want to do in our hearts, Lord, we welcome everything and all of it right now. We ask you to move powerfully. I pray that you would baptize us with the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would heal our bodies. I pray that we would rededicate our lives to you. I pray that there would be salvation that would happen in this room. We cannot leave this room without you doing in us what you want to do, Lord. And maybe that's just fresh encouragement for some. But do it, Lord. And if we need to be water baptized, Lord, I pray you'd put that on our hearts today. But we come here to worship and to serve you and not anyone else. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Let's worship together. <laughs>